Hello everyone, this is a scenario that I have discussed before, but I've added a few more questions that I think they are clinically relevant to this scenario. Um, uh, so we're going to start by a 45-year-old male patient presented with a fresh rectal bleeding. There are two important information to focus on this stem in here. So one is uh, the age of the patient, which is 45, quite young patient, and it's a fresh rectal bleeding. It doesn't specify anything else, and you're going to be asked a few pathology questions. Uh, regarding this. So the most likely diagnosis in this patient, so if it's a fresh bleeding and in a young patient, the most likely diagnosis could be a hemorrhoids, all right? Uh, so hemorrhoids it will be the most likely diagnosis. However, there are other things to rule out as well. It could be a colorectal cancer, okay? It could be a diverticular disease in a young patient as well. It could be something like angiodysplasia. It could be a bleeding disorder, or even an anal fissure as well. So these are the things to rule out, but hemorrhoids remains the main differential and colorectal cancer is an important differential to rule out. So what are the symptoms that you would like to ask for in this patient? So initially we were talking about bleeding. So we can ask uh, more history about this bleeding and that will be the amount and the color and is it initial terminal bleeding? Is it at the end of defecation or at the beginning of defecation? Is it mixed with the stool or on the outer side of the stool? All right. And also if the patient has lost consciousness after having this bleeding. So to quantify the, um, the, high, the risk of, of bleeding, of that bleeding. And if the patient has lost consciousness, and this is quite important to know the severity of that bleeding. And then we can also ask about if they had any rectal pain or any of the alarm symptoms. And these alarm symptoms could be a sign of anemia if they have noticed their color has changed recently or they're feeling pale or they're feeling lethargic all the time. If they lost any weight or if they lost their appetite and also if they lost weight we need to quantify the weight loss and also if it was intentional or non-intentional weight loss also the appetite and night sweats and night fever as well okay um, the pain is mainly focusing on two things in rectal pain and abdominal Pain. So abdominal pain is more going toward obstruction and also diverticular disease and rectal pain going towards, um, you know, the anal fissure. We can also ask about their coagulation profile or if they are taking any anticoagulant medication. What is the definition of hemorrhoids? So hemorrhoids is a vascular rich connective tissue cushion present in the lower end of the anal canal. If this is the anal canal, normally... Uh, patients, I mean, no, normal person will have a vascular rich connective tissue cushion just submucosal uh, in the lower end of the anal canal. And this is absolutely normal. It becomes only pathological when to start to be symptomatic. So if it is symptomatic, that it means it's pathological hemorrhoids. And obviously the symptoms will be a painless uh, bleeding. In addition to that, there will be maybe external hemorrhoid or protrusion coming out and this comes with many risks and this include constipation. Uh, another anatomy question, what is the length of a rectum in a normal person? It's 18 to 20 centimeter long and the length of inner canal is only four centimeter long. What is the venous drainage of hemorrhoidal veins? So you have, if this is the inner canal, um, it's divided into the upper, two, the upper um, third and lower two third, all right? So for the upper third, you have the superior rectal artery supplying it and the superior rectal vein as venous drainage. And the superior rectal vein usually goes to the inferior mesenteric vein, and this will go into the portal venous system, all right, the portal venous system. And the you have also the inferior rectal vein, which will go into uh, the inferior vena cava, and that is for the lower two-third, and obviously this is the systemic circulation. It's important to mention here, when we give the nitroglycerin for patients with anal fissure, so nitroglycerin usually causes vasodilation uh, of the blood vessel and this will promote the healing of, an, of a, a fissure. So to give nitroglycerin for those patients, 
we need to insert it to the superior rectal vein to be able to go to the liver and get detoxified. Um, because if you give it, you know, topically on the outer part of the inner canal or the lower two thirds, uh, that will go directly into the systemic circulation and cause significant headaches. So it's quite important to counsel a patient on how to uh, use the nitroglycerin um, in inner fissures. So the venous drainage, we talked about the superior rectal vein and also the inferior rectal vein, and we know where they go. Pathogenesis of hemorrhoids. So as we talked, we talked about the definition of hemorrhoid, it's uh, a vascular cushion um, uh, present in the submucosal area of the inner canal, and it's normal anatomical of uh, unfunctional structure in the inner canal. It only becomes pathological when it becomes symptomatic, such as etching, bleeding, and protrusion develops as well. Um, and the patient strains on a stool, hemorrhoids will protrude through the inner canal, and this will lead to a sensation of incomplete evacuation and etching and bleeding. And these, this question was covered before, and also this question was covered with the pathogenesis of a thrombosed hemorrhoid through its excessive straining with the increase of the intra-inner pressure will lead to a further engorgement of this uh, vascular cushion, and there will be a clot, and the, then we'll call thrombosis of the external hemorrhoids, and this is considered as an emergency patient to be taken to theater. How to diagnose hemorrhoids? So the diagnosis can always be clinical diagnosis, and that would be digital rectal examination. We're looking for an external hemorrhoid or internal hemorrhoid, or maybe a mass as well. And then we can have an invasive, a sort of invasive investigation that we can do, and that would be examination under anesthesia and plus minus um, proctoscopy. Mostly we're going to do proctoscopy in a way, plus minus sigmoidoscopy, or we can even extend it to colonoscopy, all right? So that would be the investigations to do to diagnose the um, hemorrhoids. The treatment of hemorrhoids, um, like any other surgical issue, we have conservative management and uh, also surgical management. For conservative management, we can avoid the predisposing factor, including treating conospation. For the surgical management, you have uh, like the banding and also sclerotherapy, or even, you know, the hemorrhoidectomy or removal or excision of this uh, hemorrhoids. Other causes of painless rectal bleeding, we mentioned a few things. Uh, colorectal cancer, the most important, and also you can have benign polyps, inflammatory bowel disease. However, this can be painful and angiodysplasia and a bleeding disorder as well. Other investigations we can do in this scenario, so we can always have some bloods that we can do, and these bloods will be FPC, looking for the hemoglobin level at the patient has lost some bloods, and also UNE, looking for dehydration and the complications of that, and CRP as a, base, as a baseline, uh, and also ruling out infective hemorrhoids, and LFT, liver function test for coagulation, and we can do also coagulation profile, uh, group and screen, and cross-matching if the patient requires surgery, or if the patient... Um, um, you know, lost large amount of blood and need blood transfusion, all right? Uh, these are the bloods. We can also do some imaging. These imaging that we can do will be a CT, abdomen, and pelvis if required or you're suspecting anything else. And finally, for the um, invasive, we've talked about examination under anesthesia and how to do it as well. So we've done, we've done a, a colonoscopy, um, extended to colonoscopy. What can you see in this image? So you can see the wall is really clean and uh, looking right. There are some dots in here, which looks like bleeding from the wall. And finally here, this is the main thing. It's a clean and the smooth, small polyp, which is measuring, you know, we need to measure that. Uh, I can't really quantify the measurement in here. And that will be a polyp. We can be asked about the polyps, uh, types of polyps, which can be whether an inflammatory polyp and a neoplastic uh, polyps. And the neoplastic polyp could be uh, villus polyp or um, tubular uh, polyps or tubular villus polyps. There you can be also be asked about the risk of malignancy and a polyp that will depend on the size of this polyp. If it's more than 1.5 centimeter, higher risk of malignancy and also the pathology result, whether there is any degree of dysplasia or not. And we're going to define dysplasia as well. Looking at this, there is very irregular, large masses in there that looks like cancer, okay? And the investigations required for carcinoma staging. So as we explained before, so staging, um, the difference between the staging and grading as well. So grading is a histological thing, and the staging is clinical. So we can do clinical 
staging or radiological staging or even more invasive staging. But grading is mainly a pathological process, so we're looking for uh, the cells and its differentiation. So for clinical staging, we can do it was the clinical examination. Radiological staging, we can do a CT abdomen pelvis and we can do a CT cap chest, chest abdomen pelvis as well. And we can even do MRI pelvis to look for metastasis to the tumor. And invasive, you can do a proctoscopy and then colonoscopy to look for any metastasis anywhere. And you can even do a laparoscopy, a diagnostic laparoscopy. Okay. Uh, we talked about staging. There are two classifications. We talked about this before, but there are two classifications uh, that we can talk about in um, staging of colorectal cancer. And this will be the TNM staging and also the Duke uh, criteria. Okay, so for Duke criteria, it's from A, uh, B, and C, and D. All right, so D, we're talking distant. So here we have distant metastasis and the involving of, um, I mean, obviously, uh, the pel pelvis and uh, maybe the liver and so on. Those, this is a class, class D. But in terms of C, so here we're talking about lymph node. So D is distant and C is lymph node. And here we're talking about the mucosa and the musculosa. So for A, it's uh, limited to the mucosa and the submucosal area. So basically in the wall and um, um, B will be passing through the wall. So looking at this diagram, so both of those, so here both of them are still in the wall. They haven't passed through the wall. So that will be um, grade A or, yeah, that will be do criteria A. And this one, it passed through the wall. So that would be B. And then you have uh, C as well. Uh, so that will be C, as you can see, it's even through or not through the wall, but there is lymph node involvement and four will be sort of distant metastasis. You can also be asked about the TNM staging. So T, we're talking about tissue and N, we're talking about nodes and M, we're talking about metastasis. So in terms of tissue, you have from one to four, all right, one to four. So one, including the mucosa and submucosa. Two is not through the musculosa. Three is through the musculosa. And then uh, you have, that's T1, 2, and 3. And T4 is distant. So come back again. So T4 is distant. And T1 is not debus and submucosa. T2 is muscularis, muscularis. And T3 is through the muscularis. All right. For N, you have an N1 and N2. So N1 is 1 to 3 lymph nodes. And N2 is more than 4 lymph node metastases. And obviously, M is M0, no distant metastasis, and M1, there is distant metastasis, all right? So this is the two types of staging that we know for the uh, colorectal cancer. Quite basic question, the epithelial dysplasia. So dysplasia, so normally we have the cells arranged into a certain shape and also a certain structure. I think I've gone through this concept multiple times before. So the, the cells usually in each tissue are similar to each other, and arrange and respecting the distance between each of them. But dysplasia is basically a change in this structure. So basically you want a change in size, a change in shape, and also organization of the cell. And that will be sort of like that. So you have a cell like this, and another one like that, another one like that. So as you can see, that's a change in size, and the shape, and the structure, or the organization of these cells. It is a pre-malignant condition, that's a pre-malignant condition, and can be classified into high and low-grade dysplasia. High and low-grade dysplasia uh, is a classification for dysplasia and its definition. So that's a, a sort of a new scenario, which I think uh, there are other relevant information to cover in here, and that included the uh, how to diagnose hemorrhoids and other differential diagnosis of lower rectal bleed, and seeing a few images of the um, polyps and the types of polyps and the risk of cancer from polyps and also the colorectal cancer and the staging or the TNM staging for colorectal cancer as well. Thank you very much.